My name's Zach. Last night I was uh, chatting with a young gentleman and I said, I thought I'd practice my opening line on him. I said, so have you ever wondered to yourself, how healthy am I and how can I improve my health and then been disappointed in the answer? He said, no, not really. <laughs> so, uh, so then I was thinking about it and I, and I thought to myself, uh, well, actually, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk. So today I've been asked to talk about data-driven living and some of the futuristic things we're seeing coming down the line. But before I do, I do that, I'd like to explain why I think it's an important topic. As you know, healthcare is expensive. In the US, we spend around about $2.7 trillion every year. Now, the baffling he thing here is, is that, when you, depending on who you talk to, between 20 to 30% of that is attributed, sorry, between 30 and 50% of that is attributed to preventable diseases. So put in other words, we're spending a minimum of $800 billion every year treating preventable diseases. So I, was, I figured there was a few space enthusiasts in here, so I, I thought I'd compare that to something you may be more familiar with. The combined budget since, of NASA since in, inception in 1958, that includes the Apollo mission, getting the first man on the moon, that includes the $15 billion that's spent every year now. Every year we spend that amount uh, cumulative on treating preventable diseases. For the uh, climate change experts out there, they believe that we could probably have a pretty good shot at averting catastrophic climate change if we invested $800 or $900 billion every year. For the humanitarians out there, we could cure, we could feed every hungry mouth on earth if we, in a sustainable way over a period of, say, 10 years, 27 times on 27 Earths. So, and this blows my mind, the fact that every year we're spending this amount of money on preventable disease. So we're not doing these interesting things, right? We're, um, because people are getting sick in preventable ways. So when you think about it, the healthcare system, it's complex, it's intertwined with all sorts of adverse incentives. There's a political uh, and regulatory body that seems incapable of making you know, simple utilitarian type decisions. And so it seems like a fairly complex problem that is almost impossible to solve. But actually, I don't think so. When you think about it, Really, all we need to do is look at the individual. If we can simply work out how to motivate behavior change, if we can simply try and get an individual to improve their nutrition and their behaviors and their lifestyles, then these preventable conditions disappear. So it's more manageable. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, but at least it's something we can imagine that is possible. So the good news is, is that there are a lot of smart people starting to think about this. Uh, digital health, uh, incubated rock health, um, is their, their whole focus is bringing the, the smartest minds in technology and medicine together to come up with innovative solutions. Uh, there is, um, I think it was a, a report I read where the, the digital sensor space is projected to be about a $4 billion space within the next couple of years. And then digital health companies are exploding onto the scene. What we're seeing is that most of these companies are trying to leverage some form of data. Right? On the left side here, we've got behavioral data, things like steps, activity. Then we've got the physiological data, things like heart rate, temperature, or galvanic skin response, you know, uh, skin conductance, things like that. Then we've got what we call systems biology data, thinking, looking at your blood sugar levels or your lipidomics, your lipid fractions, or how your met metabolism works. And then on the right-hand side, we have the omics, things you've heard about the genomics and the genetics, and we've got, I'm not an expert on transcriptomics, but the way that your body expresses its genetic code to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to produce what we are. So, and so what we're seeing though across the field is there's becoming an explosion in, in, the, in the amount of data that we get access to. So uh, I think it was a, in 2000, the f first genome se sequence, all three billion base pairs, it cost about $3 billion. Now we're getting to the point where we're tracking multiples faster than Moore's law. And, we, and uh, personal genomics, uh, Pioneer 23andMe, uh, it's going to be bringing out a $1,000 genome very soon. And my, my, est my guess is that within a year or so, we should be able to do a full sequence of our genetic code within a couple of years. <clears throat> There's a, a, a Qualcomm estimates there'll be 400 plus million devices uh, within a couple of years on the market. I actually think there may be more. If you start looking at some of the big name brands that are, that are hitting this market really hard, we're starting to see this become more mainstream. But then, so my question is, what, you know, is this data actually going to be useful? Is it more just interesting? Are we going to be able to use these things to actually motivate the behavior change that we need to start thinking about how to be more healthy? And, uh, and 
I, I've been sort of thinking about how to summarize this, and I, and, and I, tried, I was trying to think of what are the three sort of key things that are important for these companies to get right. And the first is this idea of passive data. Right? When you, the idea that people don't want to actually have to actively be doing things to, to start tracking themselves. It's this idea that you, once you give someone data, it's empowering and become more conscious and aware of their actions. Then there's, you've all heard of the Hawthorne effect, which is this idea that when you're studying, when, the, when a subject is studied, that generally speaking, they'll change their behaviors. Things will, uh, for un some unknown reason, they'll just do things, things differently. And for researchers, it's a big problem. So you have to come up with interesting ways of getting around that problem. But what we're seeing with, with consumer health or digital data loggers is that people are becoming the subject and the, uh, the subject and the researcher. And we're finding this effect actually applies and it's very interesting. So a few examples of companies that are doing this really well, and you've probably heard of Fitbit, but they were one of the pioneers in trying to just track steps. Simple bedometer, it's a very powerful concept, looking at motion and activity. We've got the companies like Zio and Lark, and they tra allow you to track your sleep so that you can start to understand how to improve your sleep. We then have the Withings Wireless Stale, you just step on it in the morning and then step off it and it streams your data to the cloud. Again, it's not necessarily passive, but it's, it's seamless. It's not gonna really uh, inter interrupt your life in any way. I've got a really interesting company called Azumio, which is one of my favorites. From my mobile phone, I can fire up an app and then within about five seconds, get my heart rate very accurately. They've also got an app that looks at heart rate variability so I can understand uh, relative levels of stress in my, uh, in my day. So these are the companies, and then one of my favorites, Basis, they haven't launched their product, but I've seen the prototype, and this is a really beautiful form factor watch, and which can track my heart rate. It can track heart rate variability, it can, it, it can track uh, gal skin conductance or galvanic skin response on the sensor on the back here. It can also look at ambient air temperature and body temperature, and it's got an X3, three axis accelerometer in it as well. So with that information, we can start getting really powerful insights as, into activity, sports, sleep, and just uh, and even stress, because you can look at things like heart rate variability to, to track stress. And these types of information feeds are seen as being very powerful, and I'm really excited for Basis to launch their product. I'm on the wait list. Then one of my favorites is a little bit more futuristic, a company called MC10 that's worked out how to come up with a flexible substrate, flexible electronics that can fit to any form factor. And the idea here is that we can um, stick, a, say, a tattoo-like thing on your arm, and, uh, and this will start streaming diagnostics information. But where this uh, gets really cool is when we start thinking about, well, if this is something we can put on the outside of our, of our skin, why, why don't we start thinking there's, if you, know, if you can perhaps get a heart arrhythmia or some kind of problem uh, in a fairly non-invasive way, a, a keyhole surgery, uh, surgically um, implanting this type of technology. So this is uh, an example of how you just you know, go into the heart and then this little uh, flexible electronics, you open it up and then activate it on the inner, uh, inner wall of the heart. Now this is a, a little bit futuristic, this isn't available, but these are some of the types of things that people are thinking about. Now the beauty of this is that this gentleman can just pull up his phone, he can look at his blood pressure, he can look at his heart rate, he can even probably predict if he's about to have a heart attack, all from his iPhone. So, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is, this is the, sort of the future, but it's not far off. So this idea of passivity is very important for these devices. The next is uh, this idea of engagement. Now, these devices need to be simple and fun. People need to want to engage with them. The, and there's this, you've all heard about you know, companies like Zynga who have worked out how to have people spending 70 million hours a month um, playing a pretty much useless game. Well, how, if we, can, we can use that, those types of techniques to, to basically manipulate people psychologically to improve their health based on gamifying and game mechanics. So really interesting idea. And then finally, a really big, a really obvious one is this idea of social. If your friends, if I share my data with my friends uh, and it go into some kind of competition with them, then the competitive edge comes out and, the ability, and the, this idea that people are watching you. So again, a couple of examples of companies that I think have done this really well. And I go back to Nike with the fuel band. So I've got a fuel band on here. And today, uh, when I uh, went in, I kept flew in on Thursday for a meeting and I went for a CrossFit workout at uh, CrossFit Los Angeles. And you can see in the middle there where, where I did my workout, and actually I hit my daily goal during that workout, and I got sort of this really cool thing which happened. But then, because I'd been walking around, I went for a, sort of a, I went to some, <coughs> excuse me, for some friends, and then I actually doubled my goal and I got this really cool reward. 
Yeah, can we turn the sound on? Because that's part of the cool reward. Yeah, hang on. Hang on. I've just got to wait for this video to reset. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I like it. Okay, it just goes, and it's really cool. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is, I think, a great example. And this is a billion-dollar company, and they're spending a lot of money on marketing these products. They're trying to position themselves for becoming one of the dominant players in the, the quantified self-tracking uh, self arena. The other example is a company I have a lot of respect for. It's Massive Health. And what they've called, this is what they call an experiment. It's the eatery. I think it's a really exp great experiment. They've had 10 million people ranking different food. So what you do is you take a picture of your food. It's a pretty weak signal, but then you drag it on to the rating scale, and you're done. And then what happens is other people do the same thing. And even though it's a really weak signal, it's a photo of a food. It's not the caloric int, it's not the caloric value, or anything like that. They've been able to work out that on average, and they've correlated this with obesity values around the company with a really high R squared, so very statistically relevant. And what they've done is actually worked out that on average, people think they're around about 10% healthier than they actually are, or they eat about 10% healthier than they actually are. So what this is just, it's not, it's, it's this is, this idea that bringing additional awareness to people and, sh and providing the feedback and then socializing this data is really powerful. But what these guys have also done is providing some sort of analytics. So I can learn that when I have uh, my coffee at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, I normally have a cookie as well, and that's really bad if you do that every day. And so just building this type of awareness and providing personal analytics back to the individual, it's really cool. I actually, um, yeah. So that's... Uh, that's this idea of engagement. And then the final one, and actually this is my favorite one, is this idea of insight and meaning. This data is not useful if, unless it's actually made use, uh, uh, providing some kind of insight. So I've got sort of three things here. The first is this idea it's personalized. It's not a blanket recommendation that is applicable to everyone. Uh, the second is actionable. It's something that you, actionable and, and realistic, something that you can actually do. So say nutritionally or behavioral-wise, something that is attainable on a daily basis but has longer-term impact on your health is very important. And the, th and the uh, obviously one is it's realistic. You have to be able to achieve it. So the company I work for, Wellness FX, uh, our, the, what we're trying to do is basically provide people with very deep analytics on your actual biology. So we run blood tests, we run some advanced diagnostics, we pull the data into the cloud and you show, track and trend it. We allow you to access it from any device. This is my actual data I'm showing you. And that, this, this, is a, this app was launched a couple of days ago, so um, it's pretty exciting. So basically what what I can do is I can dive in and actually look at my cardiolipid fractions, and uh, and it's yeah I can dive in and look at my I can look at my trended data. I've done about four very advanced diagnostics over the last 12 months, and you'll see I've actually managed to work out how to drive these numbers in the right direction through nutrition and behaviour and some supplements, which are very targeted based on my personal uh, my personal needs. So the so this is the you know so the data visualisation. But what we do is we try to make it actionable and we provide additional insights. So my doctor, Justin, who's part of the network, he can actually, I have a consult with him, and he comes up with very specific recommendations for me. So I don't, genetically, I, can, I know through my diagnostics that I don't metabolize folates. So, and, and so his recommendation is I to increase those, and I'm actually tracking my numbers in my, in my body. So that's the, the, what we're doing there. So, so I was asked to talk a little bit about the future, but actually, I haven't really talked about the future. This is available now. Most of these technologies are available. And so one of the things that I, th uh, when I was sort of thinking how to close this, I was thinking to myself, the, the, uh, the age, the era of, of unprecedented self-quantification is on the horizon, it's, uh, and, it's, and it's here now. The future is here. And it's just a matter of leveraging it. And, and was, the, uh, Tristan made a great point about how but there's some sort of cognitive bias, and what we see is that it applies to health as well. People, generally speaking, think they're a little bit healthier than they actually are, and changing that is actually, we're finding is quite simple if you just go given the right information. So what I'd, I'd propose to you is that if the people in this room, if we can't start engaging with these new technologies and trying to look at improving our own health, how can we expect to s solve this multi-billion dollar what is turning out to be a global problem that will break economies and will and, and stop us from doing other interesting, what I consider to be more important things like stopping global warming or feeding 27 times you know, as many people as we need to in this world um, or having a cool space program.
Thank you.